put out, so hopefully you can see my slides. Um, my name is Chris Farrow. I'm Technical Services Manager at Kronos. Uh, and as Amanda's already said, I'm going to be talking about delivering secure, reliable and traceable time in data centers. Um, starting with a really quick overview of Kronos, if you're not familiar with the company, um, and then looking at time, timing, frequency and phase delivery for applications that run in data centers, particularly focusing on the security, the, re the reliability and the traceability of the time for those applications. And then a little bit at the end about the, some of the audit services that uh, Kronos offer. So Kronos uh, is a company that's been around since 1986. Uh, Kronos is a, a system integrator with lots of technical experience across a wide range of markets and applications. Uh, Kronos is a value-added reseller. We resell um, synchronization, timing, time delivery, distribution systems uh, from one of the world leaders, a company called Microchip. We're involved in the standards bodies. We're involved in the ITU, some of the steering groups for some of the conferences and symposia that happen every year where experts get together. Um, and we started in telecom, but really as the requirements for time and synchronization have broadened out across different in, uh, across different industries, we've expanded there to cover not just telecom, but power, financial services, defense, government, law enforcement, and also broadcast. Um, as I said, we are a value-added reseller. Um, we install and support, we install commission and support some of these timing systems. We have a team uh, that's traveled all over the world installing uh, these systems. You can see there's a map there. We've installed um, systems in every corner of the globe. And we, 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 we've really got practical experience, practical, pragmatic, common sense knowledge of how these timing systems behave in the real world. And that fe feeds into uh, lots of the knowledge that's based in the company. So starting to look at applications for data centers, time really is now becoming something that, that, that underpins our modern lives completely. Almost every industry, every, every business process and lots of legislation relies on precise time. Um, going back in history, this requirement first came in with the railways in this country, in the UK, needing to uh, know where trains were uh, prior to that, each town had its own local time scale, so the railways brought along what was known as railway time, the first standardized time scale across the whole country, and then global time followed on from that later. But industries such as um, transport, uh, not just the railways, but road, sea, freight transport, air transport, the telecom industry, 5G, this picture is um, some of the trials that went on last summer uh, in London. Uh, a GPS, a GNSS antenna there providing synchronization for the 5G radio base stations that were used. 5G brings with it more precise requirements for time. Financial um, um, industry uses time for, for um, legislative use and for traceability of timestamps when trades happen to try and see uh, and try and sort out disputes and, and to try and make sure that people are following the rules. The power industry as well, broadcast, uh, uh, not to mention broadcast, um, power industry, generation, distribution of power, micro generation causing headaches for lots of these grids, broadcast, uh, and the sort of the next big things, the, the buzzwords that you might hear at the moment, artificial intelligence, big data, the internet of things, lots of big data databases. If the timestamps aren't right on the data, then the data is effectively useless. So lots of these systems are sensor systems, disparate sensor systems, and they need accurate timestamps. Typically, that is more often than not delivered by some sort of satellite navigation service like GPS. So we'll cover that later. But time really is an invisible utility, fundamental foundation for lots of businesses. So what exactly is a data center? Uh, it's a physical location. Uh, in the Hollywood movies, they typically look like this, all smart and tidy with lots of bright, shining lights. Uh, in the real world, they tend to look a little bit more like the three examples there. Basically, it's a physical location um, where typically you provide power, space, and cooling. So you're hosting, uh, hosting your own equipment in somebody else's space. And uh, more importantly, um, perhaps they provide interconnectivity. So they pro um, provide a space where you can connect into other networks. 
And time, what about time? I think by the end of this uh, this talk, hopefully I'll, I'll, you can see that I'm going to propose that time should be part of that fundamental proposition that data centers offer. Not just power, space and cooling, but time as well, because it's so important to lots of these, uh, lots of the applications that run in data centers. This list is a little bit upside down. I think the most common application is probably the traditional one, which is at the bottom of the list, the cloud hosting, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, cloud services, peering, internet exchanges, those things. Um, but more and more specialist applications are in there, like the financial industry. So the city of London, for example, lots of the trading firms that work in the city of London have presences in the data centers around and outside London. Financial um, applications like this, they're really sort of specialized enterprise style IT networks. They need time for um, regulatory traceability. So they need to be traceable in Europe uh, under this MIFID II directive to uh, UTC to within a certain level. The high frequency traders uh, need to be traceable to within 100 microseconds. Um, financial companies, they typically have technical departments that are very skilled. They have a lot of knowledge about time. Their attitude is they tend to deploy anything that works. So there's lots of ad hoc different timing systems deployed in the finance uh, space um, and sometimes customized uh, proprietary hardware solutions. Telecom, as I mentioned 5G earlier, one of the things 5G is doing is it's breaking down the radio base station, the remote transceiver that might be uh, out in a sort of urban or rural location, it's breaking some of those functions down. And now with 5G, that is really a, a software defined radio that's the remote site. Lots of the functionality is being pushed back into the network. And they're talking about running telecom 5G applications on servers in data centers. So again, they're starting to blur the line between where the telecom, the transmission network, the mobile network, the base stations, where that line blurs with the typical data networks and data centers. So these applications require precise time um, and they are in data centers. This 5G example here shows how, how the, um, the, um, the distributed unit and the remote unit, the radio unit are split and the virtualized, the centralized unit is the part that can be put within a data center. So again, 5G blurring those boundaries. So what options do we have for getting time into data centers and for distributing time around data centers? Well, there are well-known packet time transfer protocols, NTP, uh, the network time protocol has been around since uh, I think the early 80s. The first RFC was specified by the IETF, the IETF's logo here, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, the body that specifies the sort of standards for internet working. PTP, the Precision Time Protocol, IEEE 1588, been around since 2002. Um, update version 2.1 was agreed last year and published uh, this year. It's really the same packet timing protocol standard, but with hardware assistance, different network engineering, a uh, lot faster update rates, and with hardware timestamping in the packet. So it's being seen as a much more accurate version of NTP that is seeing applications, not just in telecom, but in finance as well, within data centers and also broadcast and power industries. There are some proprietary timing standards. Uh, TikTok is being looked at as a, um, a data center specific timing protocol. And there are proprietary manufacturer standards like STP from IBM that synchronizes mainframes. Where do we get time from? Um, typically it's a, a GNSS, so Global Navigation Satellite System like GPS, a sat nav system with an antenna on the roof, possibly a direct fiber connection to a national laboratory like NPL in this country, or maybe there are atomic clocks uh, that, that uh, may be installed, but we'll look at some of those, some of those things later. Typically though, there seems to be no, um, no standardized, no centralized approach. There's lots of ad hoc deployments of time and frequency systems, depending on the application. Um, the companies I mentioned at the start, Amazon, Google, Microsoft for synchronizing databases, they all have their, their own methods for doing that. So they can have data centers, even in different countries around the world. And the data in this distributed database can be synchronized. They also have some pretty horrendous non-standard handling of leap seconds, where when a leap second happen, uh, happens, they don't treat it as an extra second in the day. They, they 
slowly adjust the time during the day, which causes all sorts of problems between synchronization of those systems and other systems that do observe leap seconds. So lots of ad hoc different approaches. So in terms of security, reliability, and traceability, the first of those, security. Now, data centers, I've been in a few data centers. Um, one of the things Kronos, is, um, Kronos does is we audit timing systems. So um, with some of our field engineers, I've been in these data centers, and the physical access controls are extensive. There are three, two or three locked gates and barriers before, with, with an intercom before you can get into the sort of security room at the entrance to the data center there you have to show government photo id uh, you have to have your face scanned fingerprint scanned so you can then get access into the equipment rooms they give you a badge as a contractor as a visitor that lets you in you have to go through locked doors to get into a corridor then there'll be several locked doors before you get to the equipment room with another locked door and then the equipment is split in different cages and you have to scan fingerprints usually to get into those things so the physical access controls are really extensive so these things data centers by their nature are very secure the networks inside them are sometimes private so they're not exposed to sort of public internet or if they are internet companies then there are lots of firewalls and lots of data traffic uh, monitoring and engineering so lots of security around data centers but in terms of time this is a photograph uh, from one of the data centers where we've installed timing equipment um, this is an array of GNSS timing receiver antennas. So possibly, possibly NTP, Stratum 1 servers, possibly PTP clocks uh, that are um, uh, primary clocks that are using GPS as a reference. Um, and I could drive past the data center with a jammer, a GPS jammer or a GPS spoofer in my car. I could stand outside with that in a rucksack and I could probably knock out all of the timing receivers there. So, you know, this is a fragile radio signal, lots of lots of good information on the internet about the problem with GPS and the delicacy, the low level, the low power level of the signal means it's trivial to jam and uh, with it increasing complexity in software defined radios and open source software, it's more and more trivial to spoof GPS. So lots of physical access in data centers, but timing access questionable at the moment, I think in terms of interference to GPS. When GPS, the first uh, SatNav system, the first GNSS system was designed, it was a military system for missile guidance. Um, I, I, there are two signals. There's an unencrypted signal that all civilian infrastructure is built on. So all the timing receivers in these data centers and in telecom and broadcast finance networks, they all use this unencrypted signal. The military, they can use their encrypted signal. Um, so when it was designed, I don't think they, they, they uh, thought it was possible. It was feasible at, at that time for civilians to be able to spoof or jam the signal. So any sort of timing receiver really needs a local backup, some sort of protection against jamming and spoofing. And I'll look at one of those uh, possible solutions later. Um, um, uh, another talk that we've got, another webinar that Kronos has done, goes into more detail on this, really looks at how the prevalence of location tracking on phones and on fleet vehicles has led to this explosion of these so-called privacy GPS jammers available. You can you can put them in your favorite search engine, you can buy them on the internet. Um, so jamming is now a civilian activity and also spoofing with a with a software defined radio, a small computer and a battery like um, a Raspberry Pi. You can build one of these, put it in a backpack and spoof the GPS signal and confuse cause considerable problem for timing receivers. So what can we do about that? Well, um, Microchip produces uh, this new sort of product category, a new idea uh, known as a GNSS firewall. So this is something that would sit between an existing timing receiver and the antenna, and it does signal analysis on the radio signal that comes from the antenna. So it tries to work out, is this the real signal that's coming from the satellites or is this a spoofed signal? Lots of the spoofers, they're not very sophisticated. Um, they put default data in some of the messages from that are supposed to come from the satellite. So a product like this can, can quite easily spot looking at power levels and all sorts of different parameters within the radio signal. So it's a new idea. It goes one step beyond just that looking at the signal, but it also contains spoofer, if you like. It contains a GPS signal simulator. So if we marry that with a stable oscillator, 
if it decides that the signal from the sky is not quite right, then it can stop supplying that to the receivers in a data center and it can simulate a GPS signal, but the time reference can be used from an atomic clock inside the unit or maybe a cesium clock that's, that's next to it. So it adds this extra level of signal analysis. Um, the particular version that Microchip make, the Blue Sky, has these two different outputs, one known as validated. So this is the sky signal. Um, and it acts really as a pass-through switch. If it decides that there's something wrong with the sky signal, it will turn that output off. So this might be a primary clock in a data center, a time server, um, and rather than let this, this time server be jammed or spoofed, where the time might be steered gradually forwards or backwards and cause all sorts of problems, um, a GNSS firewall can intervene, disable that signal, and then this would go into holdover. So if this for example, was a stratum 1 NTP clock with a rubidium reference inside it, it would fall back to using the reference until such time as the sky signal was good again. Um, the microchip blue sky also has a hardened output. So uh, this is the generated, this is the simulated signal. So again, it analyzes the sky signal. If it thinks there's a spoofing attack going on, it switches over and provides its own simulated GPS signal, but with a time base that is when the GPS signal is there, these oscillators are synchronized to the sky signal. Um, and the hardened output is really a um, like a flywheel where you would carry on all the receivers. If this was a data center, all the timing receivers in the data center could be connected to this output and carry on working in a jamming or spoofing attack. Um, a third method of operation detailed here is really just for signal monitoring. So this, this product has a web-based GUI. It also interfaces with microchips um, management system known as Time Pictra. So you get all the performance graphs. You can get SNMP notifications. You can integrate then into other management systems, other monitoring software that might be installed in these data centers. In terms of NTP servers as well, um, another microchip product, the, uh, the S650 time server has hardware-based NTP uh, implementation. So again, um, lots of attacks on NTP look at, look at malformed packets and denial of service and trying to, trying to overload the processor or trying to get access to software running on uh, a CPU. Um, this particular time server has um, a hardware version of that, so, so so it's you know almost impossible to do those same sort of attacks. So again, this portfolio of products produces ha, has security for NTP as well as uh, the GNSS firewall. So in terms of reliability, um, one of the three topics I wanted to cover, um, we're really talking about redundancy and resiliency here, being able to survive possibly local failures or outages, things like jamming and spoofing. Um, another product from Microchip, the Time Provider 4100, has this mode of operation, a high performance boundary clock operation where it can act as a virtual primary reference time clock. So PRTC, the acronym is a primary reference time clock, defined in the telecom standards, but really with this product, uh, it, it will support NTP and PTP and synchronous Ethernet outputs. Uh, along with some frequency like 10 megahertz and one PPS output, so we'll interface to a wide range of equipment. The idea is that it produces over a large geographical area, so this is possibly data centers around London. This example here could be four separate data centers around London. These are connected directly by fiber links, so these are uh, using SFPs that support uh, DWDM frequencies, so you have effectively a dedicated fiber link between these boundary clocks. One site would be the node that has access to GNSS, and a cesium possibly for backup, maybe a blue sky firewall as well for looking at the signal integrity, um, and then each of these nodes, uh, we can get time around this sort of virtual, P it's called a virtual PRTC because it, it, each one of these nodes behaves, meets the requirements for the PRTC, which is better than 30 nanoseconds alignment to UTC. So in terms of reliability, we can build these type of networks that scale, not necessarily regional like this, possibly over a whole country. Uh, geographically that would scale in this way to provide very, very accurate 
time and of course the reliability comes from you have different fiber links east and west to different sites if one of these sites goes down there's a backup link around the ring um, application shown here is a, a telecom one a 5g one but this could be a financial institution this could be google amazon microsoft databases that need synchronization all these different applications can be supported by this architecture so security reliability now traceability what do we mean when we talk about traceability so lots of regulations talk about traceable to a, a legally definable standard and that usually means some form of utc so the satellite navigation services all the major constellations provide that gps provides traceability to usno so usno is a lab the u.s naval office in washington gps time is, is from that uh, usno provides um, their clocks into the utc ensemble Traceability could also mean direct to national labs like NPL in the UK uh, with its National Timing Center program um, where they deploy fiber from NPL and then possibly a PTP boundary clock. Um, but it's a physical built out infrastructure, so it's not available everywhere, whereas obviously GNSS, GPS radio signals are available uh, everywhere. Um, again, to support the financial industry, there are lots and lots of ad hoc solutions that have appeared over the years. Um, lo lots of different either telecom or financial uh, telecom providers providing little bits of infrastructure here and there. But again, really, in terms of traceability, there's no, um, there's no solution that, that, that is available and works everywhere. The National Timing Center program, as I mentioned, it's really uh, it's a program to promote visibility of time as a critical national resource. Kronos is involved um, in the early stages uh, and talking to NPL about some of the training that's going to go on about training and education, also outreach to uh, different industries, uh, different market sectors. Um, and there are some so some R&D grants available to work on this and there is a program to build out secure resilient uh, timing infrastructure around the uk that's in, that's involved uh, that's involving bt along with npl bbc and a couple of universities there's a web page on the npl website that details that in a lot more detail um, one of the solutions that Kronos can offer, as I mentioned earlier, is the audit part of the service. So we, 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 we can audit existing infrastructure, so we can inspect, measure and monitor what's already there. Um, we've done this for um, uh, quite a few companies in the City of London uh, to assess their ability to this MIFID to this European directive for the finance industry. Um, and we can, uh, just because a, a timing receiver is already deployed, uh, one of the main contributions to error in those timing services is obviously the cable length between the antenna and the receiver itself. So the, the sat nav receiver, when it's in your phone, everything's co-located. So the antenna and the, the processor, the signal processing is all in your hand. A timing receiver with maybe 100 meters of cable to an antenna on the roof of a data center, those signals take a finite amount of time to come down that signal typically three or four nanoseconds per meter so if we've got 100 meters that's three or four hundred nanoseconds of delay through the cable and so that depending on the application that might not be an issue if it's an ntp clock that is only looking at providing timestamps, event logging and call logging that's maybe half a second or a second resolution then obviously 300 400 nanoseconds isn't significant but if it's a telecom application if it's the finance application and we're starting to eat in some of those um those error budgets and those compliance margins that are in the hundreds tens maybe single microseconds range then three or four hundred nanoseconds is significant so existing deployments we can put test equipment on antenna cables and measure um, the delay uh, even if it's uh, an existing install so again these things uh, we can look we can also look at the performance of ptp uh, boundary clocks, slave clocks, uh, the master clocks, we can measure some of the timing signals that come out of them. Um, so this is a very, very uh, oversimplified view of taking a tester with an independent reference into a, a data center and, and then measuring at various points within that, either measuring the, the master the part of the distribution architecture or the slave clocks themselves. 
some of the first slides of the intro slides i had the the typical the stereotypical hollywood view of a data center where it's all nice and tidy this is some of the uh, infrastructure that we've audited you can see things in the real world don't always look like that we're in here looking for uh, a ptp clock to measure you might be able to make out depending on the quality um, this little connector here says ptp clock on it this is a boundary clock uh, from a particular manufacturer that has a, a one pulse per second output and it's obvious it's really ptp and ntp they have lots of software stats and, and they're both doing the same thing a clock a remote clock is trying to estimate the network delay there's a software process there's some hardware assistance to the software process but at the end of the day there could be big errors in there and the software could be telling you everything's fine we've got lots of experience of um of this happening where these type of clocks are deployed and either there are there are firmware issues software issues where the clocks don't work as performed um, and they're telling you everything's fine, but in reality, there's a big error on the clock. So, so fundamentally, the only way you can really be sure that the clocks are performing is to physically go in there and do the measurement. And this is part of the service uh, that Kronos offers. This is one of the, the primary reference clocks that has a one pulse per second on the back where we can measure that. Look at how the antenna cable delay has been set, if that's correct or not, if there's any problems with the antenna installation. And again, a closer a close up on this particular PTP boundary clock. Uh, here's um, one of my colleagues uh, actually doing the work. This was in one of the data centers where we were using specialist test equipment. We were looking at people, we were doing a packet capture. Um, we'd got one of the boundary clock switch ports set to a mirror port, and we were capturing all the PTP packets, doing some analysis at the packet level as well to make sure everything's okay, and then measuring the physical um, output clocks. Um, to look for compliance and alignment with the standards where they should be. So, um, in summary, um, the requirements for precise time, traceable time, reliable time systems are increasing. They're appearing in more and more industries. Um, a really good example of that is 5G. So, 5G is trying to get the most efficient use of the radio system. So between your mobile phone and the base station, to be able to cram the maximum amount of data, to be able to support the maximum number of users, um, they're looking at ways of really efficiently using that radio. And most often, more often than not, that involves increases in synchronization. The financial industry, the power generation and distribution industry, broadcast industries, they're all looking at more and more technologically complicated solutions and that again more often than not um, requires more accurate time so data centers are playing their part in this obviously security of time systems is paramount as i mentioned earlier it's relatively trivial to jam and spoof gps signals so obviously where gps is used as a timing reference we have to consider that we have to build and engineer networks with with backup with holdover possibly with things like GNSS firewalls. Um, and auditing and testing of times is absolutely essential, as I mentioned on the previous slides. Just looking at software stats, just looking at the output from a, uh, from a clock, whether it's NTP or PTP, just looking at the stacks doesn't tell you the whole story. You have to do some physical measurement at some point. And it's the MIFID II regulations in Europe uh, and corresponding regulations in North America as well that have really brought that to the fore uh, for the financial industry that, that, that deploy lots of their infrastructure within data centers. So I started at the top of the presentation talking about space, power and cooling as being what a data center offers. Really, the smart data center offering should be space, power, cooling and time. If data center operators, the people that build and operate and run data centers, they can install secure, resilient and traceable time infrastructure as part of their equipment, as part of their infrastructure, um, then I'm sure it would make sense and, and, and would do away with lots of these ad hoc uh, timing systems that have been developed for different industries. So I think I've just about covered everything. Um, that's the end of the of the slides that I had. So, uh, if there are any questions, I think uh, I can pass back over to Amanda. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Yes, um, 
I've enabled questions and answer mode now. So if anybody's got any questions, please do put them forward. Um, I've had one. Do multi-constellation GNS receivers offer better protection against jamming and spoofing? Um, yes, they do, is the short answer to that. They do, they do offer some protection. So uh, a multi-constellation receiver for timing, as we're seeing now, is um, a receiver that can look at not just GPS, but Galileo, the European system, GLONASS, the Russian system, and Beidou, the Chinese system. Um, all these different systems have their own timescales. I think probably GPS and Galileo are the closest in terms of time alignment. Um, GLONASS and Beidou uh, obviously refer to the Russian and Chinese timescales. Multi-constellation receivers can do some analysis on differences in the time and look at if there's a large difference, for example, between GPS and the other three, if they're built into timing systems that have the capability to do it, then they can you know, disqualify GPS as a constellation. So they do offer some protection against jamming and spoofing, but, but jamming, they're all, they all use roughly the same frequency. So if you can jam, a jammer is really just a noise source, a higher power noise source than the signal that you're trying to jam. So if you can jam GPS, you can probably jam the other three constellations as well. So, so they do go some way. Um, and there are multi-frequency receivers we're seeing now as well. So GPS runs on L1 normally for the course acquisition code. Multi-frequency receivers can look at signals that are on L2 and they can be more accurate because using two different frequencies can account for some of the delay, some of the uncertainty through the ionosphere and the troposphere. So multi-frequency, multi-constellation receivers, they do go some way to give you better accuracy and a little bit more um, resilience against spoofing. But uh, and in terms of spoofing, if you have a, if you build a spoofer that spoofs GPS and not the other constellations, then um, again, you could just build four software-defined radios that spoof the other signals as well. So it, it will make spoofing a little bit more complicated. But if you're facing um, an adversary, uh, a nation state, or any bad actor, anyone acting in bad faith who's really determined, then that, that, that's not going to stop them. So having an offline backup is typically the best way to do it. Again, you would use something like a GNSS firewall, have a local oscillator, a local maybe cesium oscillator that you can fall back to if you think that there's something going on with the, um, the radio signal. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, which of MTP and PTP is the more widely deployed timing service? Um, the most widely deployed one, I think, is NTP. NTP has been around for a long time. Like, I think the, the initial RFC was something like 1985, I think, um, version zero. So NTP is up to version four at the moment. Um, NTP, I think it said on one of the slides, is the um, de facto time synchronization protocol because it runs over the internet and it runs on just about anything, you know, any internet of things, um, transceiver, oh, excuse me, any internet of things, transceiver, um, typically has some sort of NTP um, client in it. Um, so yeah, NTP is obviously the most widely deployed, um, but PTP is becoming more and more popular and it's for the higher higher accuracy requirements like telecom, like, like all, all the industries that I've mentioned where NTP is a software only protocol that runs over wide area networks, doesn't have any hardware assistance. So the delays through the network, NTP's estimate of network delays is much more error prone and much more varying than PTP with hardware assistance. So NTP is the much more widely deployed protocol, but the very high accuracy systems like the things we've been talking about, PTP is really um, the only solution. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Um, that's it. I think we don't have any more questions unless there's anything you'd like to add. Um, nothing really uh, more than the um, on the final slide. I'll just go back to that, uh, you know, in terms of data centers. Moving on from this idea of just being space, power, cooling, and interconnection, I think time should be added as one of the foundations, one of the fundamental things. So maybe just finish with that thought. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Chris. Have a nice day, everybody. Thanks, bye.